I feel like we don't talk enough about how most metaverse science fiction stories are set in dystopias. This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Hey y'all, welcome back to my channel. Today we are talking about a topic that I have been trying to untangle for a few weeks now and ended up falling down a research rabbit hole on, so that is why this video is up on a Tuesday instead of on a Monday. And that topic is, of course, the metaverse. In fact, if you want to know that I've fallen down a research rabbit hole, you should subscribe and turn on your post notifications. You've probably heard a lot about it lately due to Facebook's recent rebrand, but it turns out that there is a lot to unpack here. For one, what do we even mean when we talk about the metaverse? Somewhat unsurprisingly, we don't have a very consistent definition for what the metaverse is. So depending on who you ask, it can be anything from high-tech 3D renderings of immersive virtual worlds to virtual spaces where you can interact with people that you just can't interact with physically. The best definition that I could find was actually a set of attributes essentially from The Verge, which described the metaverse as digital platforms that have some of the following characteristics. So features that overlap with either real world activities or older web services, real time 3D computer graphics and personalized avatars, a variety of person-to-person -person social interactions that are not necessarily competitive or goal-oriented in the way that stereotypical video games might be, support for users creating their own virtual items and environments, links with outside economic systems so that people can profit from virtual goods, and then designs that are well-suited towards virtual and augmented reality systems, even if they support other things too. Interestingly, the term the metaverse actually originates from Neil Stephenson's book Snow Crash, which came out in 1992. And there's a lot of uh, interesting metaphors in this book. It's set in the 21st century where the federal government has ceded power to entrepreneurs and private corporations. And where rampant hyperinflation in the US has pushed people towards digital currencies, i.e. crypto cryptocurrencies. On top of that, global economic turmoil has forced certain populations to migrate from their home countries towards other countries that may not want them there. So nothing like what's happening right now. <laughs> now, if you're my age, Ready Player One, which came out, I believe, in 2011, was probably your first introduction to the metaverse. And if you're younger than me, something like Hank Green's second book in his sci-fi series, A Beautifully Foolish Endeavor, may have been how you kind of came across the idea. But when you think about the broadest definitions of the term the metaverse, we've had that for a while. So thinking back all the way to AOL Instant Messenger, which is before my time, and more recently, a lot of examples of MMORPGs, so massive multiplayer online role-playing games, things like Second Life, World of Warcraft, Sims, Club Penguin, Neopets. Wait, were Neopets the original NFTs? Hold on, I might have just broken my brain. Anyway, in short, if we're talking about digital spaces where you can interact with people that you wouldn't necessarily be able to do in real life physically because of geographic reasons, or if we're talking about immersive digital spaces, a lot of these things we already have. In fact, the more recent example of this is probably something like Roblox. We also have had virtual reality and augmented reality for a while, although that hasn't quite become as mainstream as stuff like chat rooms have for understandable reasons. I think that Pokemon Go is probably at least in my experience, one of, I think, the first mainstream examples of something like augmented reality, as well as that app that everyone had in high school where you could cast spells like Harry Potter by waving your phone around. Or that might have just been my friends, I don't know. And then of course, cryptocurrencies have been around for a while as a digital currency for people who were interested in decentralized finance. So as you can see, there are a lot of examples of things that we might call the metaverse. Understandably, the last year and a half of the panorama has definitely thrown more people into, I think, what we would call the metaverse than were originally necessarily interested in that. So things like having meetups on places like Gather Town have introduced people to these virtual spaces where you can interact with people in a way that is similar to how you might interact with them in real life, but where you are physically separated from them. So in terms of where we are currently, there are essentially three major pushes for metaverse digital platforms. I would say the first one is major tech companies. So as we all likely know, uh, Facebook rebranded its parent company as Meta as a pretty unsubtle hint that they want to push more towards metaverse systems. Of course, they're not the only large tech company to be interested, especially in virtual reality and augmented reality systems. So there's been a lot of interest from large companies in developing, I suppose, what they think will be kind of the next generation of how we interact with each other. 
The second push is then smaller companies, so platforms like Second Life, Roblox, although I don't know if you can necessarily call Roblox a small company anymore, but in any case, companies that aren't necessarily interested in creating fully immersive worlds, but that are interested in creating more niche specific applications of metaverse platforms so that you can do specific things. And then the last one, which is the one that I found myself doing a lot of reading about, especially for this video, and there'll probably be more videos on this in the future, so if you want to hear more about this topic, you can definitely let me know in the comments and let me know what you'd be interested in seeing. And that's the decentralized slash crypto communities and the Web3 push. One of the key parts of the metaverse in Snow Crash is the fact that hyperinflation has forced people towards using digital currencies, and obviously that hasn't necessarily been an issue on the scale that it is in that book uh, in, in our world. But we do have a lot of people increasingly becoming interested in and using cryptocurrencies as a way of, you know, exchanging digital goods, such as things like NFTs, for something that they value. And then something that has come up on my radar recently, which really interests me, are DAOs, which stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organizations. They're essentially groups of people who buy into a particular crypto token. And I think the most well-known one right now is probably Friends with Benefits. And the idea is that these are communities that have shared interests, and so they invest in the community by purchasing this token and can use that to, you know, host events or meet people or anything like that. And I think that it's interesting for a lot of reasons. Um, as someone who is a member of a real life private members club, I think on some level I can see the appeal versus something like, you know, a club that you find on Meetup where you're not necessarily paying to participate. At the same time, because crypto is essentially a security, it's essentially, you know, something that you're speculating on, I definitely wonder how that impacts, you know, the, the development of an online community or a metaverse community when it's so explicitly tied to money, even if it's digital money in that way. Having said that, when it comes to the vast majority of people, if you're wondering what does this mean for me, it honestly doesn't mean that much. I think a lot of things that we talk about as being metaverse systems are things that we already use and enjoy without necessarily needing that framing. Having said that, I do think that there are some interesting accessibility related pros to something like a metaverse for people who are neurodivergent, for people who are disabled. I think that there's probably some cool stuff that we could see come out of that. But as with most emerging tech, it also definitely has potential for abuse, especially since you're dealing with digital avatars in some cases, or people that you know, you've know you never met in real life that you don't necessarily know who they actually are. And there's definitely a lot of potential for people's trust to be misused or for people to get scammed or for people to get hacked. Like a lot of DAOs have been dealing with recently. So it's not a neutral system. Regardless, the ongoing development and expansion of the metaverse will require technical and non-technical people to come together to create an experience that everyone can enjoy. And if you're interested in being part of that journey, I would highly recommend checking out Brilliant, who are kindly sponsoring today's video. If you've heard me talk about Brilliant before, then you know that it's a website and app built off the principle of active problem solving. In fact, they recently updated a bunch of their courses to be even more interactive, which I really appreciate as someone who learns better using visual and physical intuition than through rote memorization. Brilliant has a great set of courses for anyone interested in dipping their toes into STEM learning, including their brand new logic course. Packed with opportunities for hands-on problem solving, exercises like this one open up your mind and help you look at problems in a completely new way. And since we're coming up on the holiday season, Brilliant also makes a great gift for any of the ambitious learners in your life. Whether it be an inquisitive niece, an all-knowing parent, or a neighbor who seems to have everything, I know your curious loved ones of all ages would be excited to grow with Brilliant's interactive learning approach. If this sounds like something that you or a loved one would be interested in, you should head on over down to the description because the first 200 people to sign up for Brilliant using my link will get 20% off the annual premium subscription for you or for someone else.